Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We've just opened the webinar and people are still coming in. So I'm going to give it about one more minute and then we're going to get started. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you everybody for attending this afternoon. This is a webinar on the future of work, the rise of automation and the future workforce. So I'm gonna tackle a few housekeeping things first. First, I'm gonna ask anybody who's having trouble hearing or has any technical issues to please type into the chat. And we have Emma Kofit on standby ready to help with that. Um, we also have a Q&A box. And so as we're going through the presentations and you have questions for uh, speakers or panelists, um, you can type your questions into that Q&A box. Everybody's coming into the webinar on mute, um, but I hope these chat boxes and Q&A boxes will help you be able to um, participate. All right, also want to note that at the end of this webinar, um, there will be a post-event survey and you can give us feedback. So please take a moment and fill that out. Additionally, this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available for you um, next week. So let's go to the next slide and get started. Okay, first of all, um, thank, the, uh, thank the participants today. And I also really wanna thank our partners and our funders. So this research paper that we're presenting today is a partnership between Valley Vision and the Center of Excellence at the Los Rios Community College District. And this research is done in partnership and with the support of the four Workforce Development Boards of the Capital Region, and that includes the Sacramento Employment and Training Agency, Golden Sierra, Yolo County, and North Central Counties Consortium. So I wanna thank our uh, Workforce Board partners for their leadership and for their support. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so my name is Evan Schmidt. I'm the Senior Director of Valley Vision. And before we launch in, I do wanna take just a minute and talk a little bit about the work we do in the 21st century workforce. And Valley Vision does a lot of work to support, a regional, to support regional talent development. And so some of those roles include advancing research, and you're gonna see uh, evidence of that partnership, of that research partnership today. Um, we do convening, whether virtual or in person. Um, we bring people together in order to respond to the pressing issues that are going on in workforce. And we work to align the different entities, um, including employers, education, and workforce to create solutions in this space. And you can see some of the projects that we work on. Um, today, we're really kind of nested in that future of work space, um, but we do a lot of other things as well, including creating regional sector advisories um, with the Strong Workforce Program. Um, we work to support specific sectors and um, we work on Advancing, advancing digital skills, um, which really is a part of our future of work initiative as well, because um, that's one of the implementation strategies to preparing our region for the future of work. So before we launch into the content, I'm gonna try something that's new for me, and that is launching a poll for everybody. So before we, um, before we get in, I want to check the pulse of people who are participating today. So Emma, if we could launch the poll, Okay, so let's, let's find out what your pulse is on technology issues, because that's what we're going to be talking about today. So how do you feel about the ways that COVID-19 has changed the way you use technology at work? And I see people are already chiming in. The, the changes have been welcome, and I hope to keep them after shelter in place is over. Meh, it's been okay. We'll keep some things, but mostly want to get back to normal. And finally, make it stop. I don't like the new way of using technology and want everything to be as it is, which right now is not looking like a popular option. Emma, can people see this or is, can only I see this? Everyone can see it. Attendees are now viewing the question. Well, maybe only I can see it, but let's share the results. Yep, so we have. We can't see it, Evan. All right, like I said, this is new for me. So, um, all right, but now you can see it, right? Now we can. Perfect, okay. So, um, interesting, it looks like changes have been welcome. 
um, for the majority of our participants today, 68%. So that's good news because changes are coming and, um, and that's what we're gonna get in today. So let's go to the next slide. All right, I wanna give you just a, a sense of what we're gonna be doing today um, with our agenda. So we've already covered uh, the first two points and we're gonna get into the automation risk report that has been done by the Center of Excellence. We're gonna have some time for Q&A and then we have a panel of sector experts um, to talk about how these uh, trends in automation and other types of trends are impacting their work and their sectors. We'll have some more time for Q&A and um, then we'll kind of wrap up talking about next steps and we'll end our webinar for today. All right, so the research that you're about to see is part of a bigger body of work that Valley Vision is working on um, in partnership with, uh, with actually really many, many of our community partners, including um, the workforce boards, uh, Los Rios Center of Excellence and others. Um, and it's really to look at look at um, the risk of automation in our region and how we might respond to it. So our first objective has been to quantify automation risks for skills and sectors in the capital region. And that's what you're going to see about today. Um, and we think that being able to really get our arms around what does automation look like across different skills and across different sectors, that's going to allow us to respond more effectively within the region when we're looking at training opportunities and other types of actions that we're taking to support talent. Uh, we want to share the findings and vet the data with on the ground experiences. So that's the, the webinar today, but it's also interviews and other work that we're doing. We want to develop regional strategies to mitigate displacement and also optimize new opportunities as changes to work occur. So there is a displacement risk, but there's also new opportunities that come with new technologies. And finally, we want to set a path to implement strategies uh, to adapt to the changes that are coming. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, I'm really happy to introduce Ebony Benzing. She's the research manager at the um, Center of Excellence for Los Rios Community College District. So Ebony, I'm gonna turn it over to you and she's gonna um, present her research. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, next slide, please. So my name is Ebony Joy Benzing, and I am the research manager for the North Far North Center of Excellence for Labor Market Research. There are eight centers of excellence across the state, and our collective mission is to provide labor market data and other types of analyses to California Community College career education programs. In the fall of 2019, Valley Vision enlisted the North Far North Center of Excellence to provide an analysis on how artificial intelligence and automation will impact jobs in the capital region. The report, Automation Risks for Jobs in the Capital Region, represents the culmination of that work and is what I'm presenting today. Next slide. So for today, I'm going to cover the following topics. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about the purpose of this work. Second, I'd like to define automation risk and how it is used in this report. Next, I will give a brief overview of the capital region and its workforce. Then I will present on the key findings from the report with a focus on industry, occupations, and job and worker characteristics. And lastly, I will close with some future considerations. Next slide. So to start off, I'd like to acknowledge the breadth of research that's available about this topic. There's quite a bit of literature out there, most notably coming from the Kenzie and Brooke Bings, and it is focused on examining the impacts of automation and AI on a global and national scale. Reports commonly focus on the impact to industries and occupations while hinting towards the need for continual upskilling and equipping workers with the knowledge necessary to excel in increasingly automated workplaces. Keeping in line with previous reports, the goal of this work is to examine the potential impact of automation on a local level while answering three primary questions. One, what does the capital region labor force look like? Two, how will it be impacted by automation and artificial intelligence? 
And three, what can we do to better prepare for the impending scale shift? This work will also be used to support capital area workforce development boards and partners in developing evidence-based layoff aversion strategies in response to the impact of automation and AI. Next slide. I'd like to take a quick minute or two just to orient you to how I write and talk about automation risk in this report. First of all, automation risk really speaks to the likelihood that work activities or tasks associated with a particular occupation might be automated, which is really the substitution of human labor with machine labor. For the purpose of this report, we look at occupations or jobs as a collection of tasks, the things that workers do. Some tasks can be automated, like attaching a label to a finished product, while others cannot, like supporting a child's social and emotional development. While almost no occupation will be unaffected by automation, occupations that can have some tasks automated will not necessarily be fully displaced. I'd also like to point out that the data in this report does not predict which occupations will be lost due to automation, nor does it predict the creation of new and emerging jobs. Next slide. So the study looks at the risk of automation associated with most jobs in the nine county capital region. The nine county capital region covers nearly 10,000 square miles and contains about 2.6 million residents with Sacramento County holding the largest share of the population. While the region is less diverse than California as a whole, we are experiencing demographic shifts similar to those being witnessed across the state. For instance, people who identified as white made up just over half of the population in 2018, compared to 37% across the state. And some of the fastest growing populations in the region include Asian and Hispanic slash Latinos. These groups have grown between 17 and 25%, and growth in the region is outpacing growth across the state. Similar to the state, our region has witnessed an increase in the 60-year-old plus population. Overall, the 60-plus group represented about one-fifth of the region's population and was the fastest-growing age group between 2010 and 2018. Other noticeable increases among age groups included the 30 to 39 year old age population, which grew by about 16%. The second fastest growing age range behind the 60 plus group. Next slide, please. In terms of the region's workforce, there were nearly 1.2 million workers aged 16 to 65 in 2018. The region's unemployment rate has a similar trajectory to that of the states, but tends to trend a little bit higher. By the end of 2018, the region had an unemployment rate of 5.8%, which was a little more than 1% point above the state's unemployment rate. Next slide. In terms of sectors, the capital region has a fairly diverse mix of industries employing workers, but like other places, some industries are larger than others. In 2018, just over half of the capital region's workforce was concentrated in six of 21 industry sectors. These sectors include healthcare with about 13% of all jobs in the region, retail trade at 10% of all jobs, accommodations and food services, which are largely hotels and restaurants at 8%, construction at 7%, the administrative services sector, which includes support, waste management, and environmental remediation services at 6%, and the professional scientific and technical services sector at 6%. The other half of the region's jobs are distributed across the remaining 15 sectors, ranging from manufacturing and transportation to finance and government. Next slide. So the next part of my presentation is focused on key findings. In this section, I will talk a little bit about some of the interesting discoveries from this report, as well as suggest some implications behind the meaning of the findings. Next slide. In 2016, McKinsey and Company released a report that looked at which American industries were most susceptible to being automated. 
The report was able to estimate the share of time workers spent doing various tasks and which of those tasks could be automated using current technology. As stated before, certain tasks are more likely to be automated over others. And three types of tasks have a high potential for automation. Predictable physical tasks, processing data, and data collection. As a result, industries where workers spend a significant amount of time doing these types of work are more likely to be significantly impacted by automation. With that in mind, the chart here compares a selection of industries automation potential to an average of automation risk across all the industries. In the capital region, about 50% of the workforce is concentrated in six sectors, and three of those sectors have an above average automation score. Those sectors are accommodations and food services at 0.73, retail at 0.53, and construction at 0.47, which is just above the average score. Other industries that are highly susceptible to automation are manufacturing, which is due to the predictable physical work, agriculture for some unpredictable physical work. And what I want you to think about there is harvesting produce and transportation and warehousing. These are also industries where we are already seeing automation of certain activities. It's important to note that while an industry may have a relatively high automation risk, there's still considerable variation of risk among occupations in those industries. I'll touch more on this in the upcoming slides. Next slide, please. Now, we'll take a look at some occupational data. Just so you know, automation risk for occupations is largely based on Frey and Osborne's 2013 work, The Future of Employment, How Susceptible Are Jobs to Computerization. Their work quantified automation risk by assessing the probability of computers to perform tasks associated with any given occupation. In this report, automation risk is broken into three categories using quartiles. High-risk occupations had computerization probability scores that fell in the topmost quartile. Medium-risk occupations had scores that fell within the third quartile and low-risk occupations had scores in the bottom two quartiles. Of the 1.2 million jobs in the capital region, 32% were categorized as high risk, 29% were medium risk, and almost 40% were considered to be at low risk of automation. These numbers somewhat mirror national estimates of automation risk. A 2019 study from researchers at Brookings found that 36% of U.S. jobs would experience a medium level of exposure to automation by 2030, while another 39% would face low exposure. Next slide, please. The next few slides will illuminate how certain characteristics, both of, both of the occupation and worker, align with automation risk. The current slide shows that Jobs most at risk of automation, i.e. those high risk jobs, tend to pay less. So across all jobs in the capital region, the average entry level wage was about $19 per hour. The $14.50 you see here represents the average entry level wage for workers in high risk occupations. Each automation risk category, the high, medium, and low, has its own calculated average wage and was compared to this $14.50, which is the lowest average wage across the three categories. Using the $14.50 as a benchmark, we can compare the share of jobs that pay more than $14.50 per hour to the share that pay less than $14.50 per hour. And from here, we can see that there are more jobs that pay less than $14.50 per hour and they tend to be concentrated in high and medium risk of automation occupations. Next slide, please. We can also examine automation risk by sorting occupations based on the typical entry level education required for entrance into the occupation. This study broke education levels into four areas. Less than a high school diploma, a high school diploma including its equivalent, the GED, some college or an associate's degree, and a bachelor's degree and beyond, including those graduate and professional level degrees. 
Jobs requiring lower levels of education tend to have the highest risk of automation. This is particularly true for jobs requiring a high school diploma. This is particularly true for jobs requiring a high school diploma or less. 88% of these jobs are in occupations considered to be at high risk of automation, while 26% are low risk. And a quick note on summing these categories, they don't actually add horizontally across, they actually add vertically. So all the numbers in the red would add together, all the numbers in the orange would add together and so on. Next slide, please. So much of the national narrative around automation has found that men are much more vulnerable to automation due to their overrepresentation in high-risk occupations in production, transportation, and construction. However, the reverse is true for the capital region. Women are most at risk due to their disproportionate representation in administrative support, food preparation, and retail-related occupations. Overall, women represented 58% of all workers in high-risk occupations, which included jobs like office clerks, where 83% of office clerks in the capital region were women, cashiers, where 70% are women, almost 65% of fast food workers were women, and 95% of secretaries and administrative assistants were women. All of these occupations have computerization probability scores above 0.92, indicating a high likelihood of automation. Next slide, please. Historically minoritized or underrepresented workers are most at risk of automation. This is because of their overrepresentation in medium and high risk occupations and underrepresentation in low risk occupations. For instance, 32% of all jobs in the capital region are categor categorized as high risk, yet 34% of Hispanic and Latino workers are in high risk occupations. This includes occupations like landscaping and groundskeeping, where 56% of the workers are Hispanic or Latino. Also, Hispanic Latino workers make up nearly 30% of the jobs for office clerks and fast food workers. In contrast, 30% of Hispanic and Latino workers are employed in low-risk occupations. Another group that we're typically concerned with are Black workers. Black workers' lower share of high-risk occupations is accounted for by their overrepresentation in medium-risk occupations. Uh, those occupations include healthcare support, such as personal care aides, and protective services like security guards. Black workers are also underrepresented in low risk occupations. Next slide. So this is my plug to encourage you, if you haven't already done so, to read the report in depth. There's much more information about the region's population, industries, and lists of high and low risk occupations, top occupations in the region, as well as recommendations. Next slide. To summarize, what all of this data is really pointing to is that some of the disparate segmentation we're seeing in our region's labor market will cause certain workers to face more change and disruption due to automation. We will see those impacts among low wage workers, workers in occupations requiring lower levels of education, women in certain occupations, and historically minoritized workers. With that said, I'd like to leave you with some questions to think about. How is the coronavirus pandemic speeding up decisions about implementing automation in the workplace? How will automation and AI impact our education and training systems? And what skills will enable workers to better weather automation transitions in the workplace? Also, is there such a thing as automation proof skills? Next slide. So um, thank you so much for your time today. If you have any questions, I'd like to encourage you to reach out to me. That's my contact information. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ebony. Uh, that was a great presentation and just really great information that seeds a, uh, a good conversation for us. And I think, you know, ending on your last slide talking about COVID-19 and 
and how that disruption is kind of layering on top of technology trends and technology disruptions that are also happening, happening um, puts us in a position of, of really a unique time and place of looking at um, how are these disruptions impacting us and what might we expect for the future uh, that might look different than what we've had in the past. So um, with that, I do wanna open up for question and answer and Renee John, our um, project leader in workforce is going, has been keeping her eye on the Q&A um, for questions coming in. So Renee, any questions that you'd like to um, address to Ebony that you're seeing? Yes, uh, we have a couple of questions. One question submitted was about, uh, is there any information related to age disbursement of workers being higher risk for automation displacement? So we are, we're able to kind of take a look at occupations and then sort also by, by age. And we can see if there's kind of a correlation between age and workers being in that higher risk, um, those higher risk populations. I will say I kind of just took a look at this yesterday because I anticipated this being one of the questions that came up and it wasn't in my report. And generally what I was finding is that when you sort by age, um, typically, older populations or older workers tend to be in more of those low risk occupations. Um, there were a lot more um, workers kind of in, and I'm just talking about occupations, looking at a like two digit SOC code. Um, for those of you who don't know, that's how we classify occupations. Um, and you can go all the way down to an eight digit level for more granular information. But just looking at that two digit SOC code, some of the common things that were popping up were uh, around management when looking at that older age group. Um, but it is most definitely an area that could benefit from some additional study and analysis. Excellent. Uh, we have a couple additional questions. There's a question about um, getting a copy of the report and that will be sent to you after this webinar. Uh, we have another uh, comment question. Automation of work requires investments in equipment, technology, and training. Is there any survey data yet about whether companies have the capacity and are planning to make these investments in automation quickly during this recession? Um, to quickly answer your question, not that I know of. A lot of the research literature um, that I've seen kind of around this topic does address that. And um, it's, the potential to automate really comes down to kind of like that will, but then also the cost to do so and what kind of technology we have in place. But I would imagine that cost would be a huge uh, prohibition to moving forward with some of those things, especially with um, small business owners and whatnot. Um, but going back just to answer your question, not, not that I've seen, I haven't seen a lot of survey data around that just yet. Thank you. There's one additional question Adding to automation risk, is the COVID crisis also showing businesses how much work can be done remotely and therefore can be offshored to lower wage countries? Is anyone looking at this? So some of the things that are coming out right now regarding the ability to work remotely um, and who can do that and whatnot, uh, it's it's, it's quite mixed, but I will say though that um, people who are most vulnerable right now during the crisis, those people who are like our frontline workers, most definitely don't usually have the option to work remotely. Um, a huge proportion of the essential workers that we're seeing, they're required to be in their jobs and whatnot. Um, so it will be interesting just to kind of see what more literature comes out. Things are still coming out on a daily basis around this, uh, but that's kind of my knowledge about it so far. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Renee, and thank you so much, Ebony. I think um, both of those questions transition us really well into the next phase of this webinar to really talk about business experience on the ground, um, how companies are thinking about this and how we're adapting and changing here in the region. So um, before we get into that, I have one more audience poll. So Emma, let's launch this. This is now my second time doing it, so I anticipate I'll do a lot better than I did the first time. 
All right, so how do you think automation or other technologies will change your workplace? Do you think we'll adopt technologies that will dramatically change the way we do work? We'll adopt technologies that will slightly change or we don't think technology is gonna impact the way we do work in the next three years. Give it just another minute or two, or not minute, give a few more seconds. All right. And we are sharing the results. So it looks like um, our, our middle. So we will adopt technologies that will slightly the change the way we do work in the next three years, but the dramatic change option is in pretty close second. So, um, and then looking at the technology won't change the way we do work. That's really um, not the case for anybody who's on the, for very few people who are on the webinar today. So great information. It looks like we are all um, in this zone of technology is going to impact the way we're doing, we're, the way we're doing work. So with that, let's go to the next slide and let's talk about what that looks like um, for a few key sectors in our region. And I'm really happy to welcome our panel. We have David Van Wellos, who's with the Census Bureau. We have Kevin McGrew, who's dually af affiliated with Siemens and the Sacramento Valley Manufacturing Initiative. And we have Mike Testa, the president and CEO of Visit Sac. So welcome to our panelists. Thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna let everybody briefly introduce themselves and um, while you're doing that, please answer the question, what surprised you from the report that we just saw? So anything that really jumped out at you and, and you think is gonna be really key um, in your experience and in your work. So let's start with um, Mike. Okay, well, thank you for uh, having me. Um, you know, it's obviously been an interesting few weeks and I think this, this report was really timely, especially with, you know, like people have said, what's going on with COVID-19. So uh, a little bit about me, I've been with Visit Sacramento for about 19 years now. I've been the president and CEO for the last three years. Um, we are a sales and marketing organization. Our job is to bring people to town and have them stay in hotels and spend their money at local businesses. And we haven't been doing much of that in the past few months. Uh, you know, for me, there were a couple of surprises in the report. One of them that stuck out to me was uh, that we were less diverse than the rest uh, of the state. You know, one of the things that has always been unique about Sacramento is the diversity of our population. And in 2002, Time Magazine named us one of the, you know, the most diverse city in the country. And some of that was from an income standpoint, uh, the uh, people's occupation. But I, I was definitely surprised to see that. And I, I think one of the things that struck me the most in, in reading it, you know, I, I think we've all thought about automation on some level and certainly for, for me in the hotel world, I, I've thought about it a lot, but as your brain starts going and especially because it's all top of mind for us these days, you realize how many things can be automated. And, you know, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but the, the percentage of jobs that would be affected in the next 10 years by 2030 was fairly staggering. And, and again, I think this pandemic will cause more, uh, creativity and, and more thought on what can be automated. So uh, it's, it's not something that, that I think is going to improve uh, for the workforce moving forward. Whoops. Thanks, Mike. Let's go to Kevin next. Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin McCrew. And I am the Director of Quality Management at Siemens Mobility Rolling Stock in South Sacramento. We build trains, rail cars, and light rail vehicles. Business is booming. In fact, since the COVID-19 uh, uh, issue of, that, that really impacted us starting in mid-March, we have picked up several uh, key contracts, including, I am glad to say, Sacramento RT. So for the first time in over 20 years, we will uh, have an opportunity to build new rolling stock for our own hometown uh, transit agency. And we're very excited about that. I'm also here representing Sacramento Valley Manufacturing Initiative. Sacramento, Manufa uh, Valley, Sacramento uh, Valley Manufacturing Initiative is an organization of manufacturers, rep, uh, for manufacturers that we're basically uh, providing workforce development and uh, a pipeline of talent for our manufacturing jobs for the 21st century. 
three things stood out uh, from the report. First of all, at just 3.5%, uh, manufacturing does not make up a significant portion uh, of our workforce. However, we understand manufacturing is vital to wealth creation. We actually create wealth. We're not passing it from one pocket to another. We also represent 2,700 manufacturers in that 42,000 employees. Second, I wouldn't say surprised, but I would note that automation and its impacts are not sneaking up on us in the manufacturing industry. Manufacturing has always been at the forefront of understanding what a particular machine can do to automate a certain process. So unlike COVID-19's impact that came at us without warning, that's certainly not the case with automation. And the third thing I would like to point out is even though you think uh, a lot of people that are not familiar with manufacturing think of it as predictable physical work. Uh, sometimes they have in their mind a Charlie Chaplin or a Lucille Ball struggling to keep up with a conveyor belt. That's not really what small manufacturers do. Most of our manufacturers, in fact, uh, uh, over 50% of our manufacturers have uh, 50 or excuse me, 94% of our manufacturers have 50 or fewer employees. And the key point about each one of those employees is they have to be multi-skilled. They may be working on a, on a, on a uh, conveyor belt one hour, but they're creating work orders and taking orders uh, at some other point in the day. So they're multi-skilled. So that's some of the things I, I got out of the report. Great, thank you, Kevin. And David, how about you? What was surprising to you? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, David Banuelos here with the U.S. Census. Uh, a little bit of, of my background prior to uh, starting with the census a little over a year ago, I come from uh, the local Sacramento community uh, running uh, different social services and, and uh, different nonprofit programs. Um, so really what stood out to me uh, and, and why I wanted to reference a little bit of my background um, in, you know, in, in the nonprofit world, um, what I really saw was, um, you know, hit trends, labor market trends that were very historical as well in the fact that um, if, you, if we are addressing barriers to employment, uh, one, you know, a few of uh, the points that stood out to me, um, again, you know, high risk, is the lowest waged uh, staff we have, lower the education, the higher risk. Um, and then the other point that, that stood out to me was again, uh, women are more at risk too. So again, you know, coming from a community perspective, we, we've seen these trends happening uh, for, for many, many years, decade after decade. Uh, one, the other thing that really stood out to me in, in Emily's presentation on the wheel of industry sectors is the fact that healthcare and social service assistance uh, in that sector was 13.4%, which is above all of the other sectors. So again, if we're looking at this from a community perspective in the fact that e these essential healthcare workers and social service providers will still have to be at the forefront and still maintain being um, essential and, and frontline staff, again, how do we ensure that they, may, they have access and are able to maintain those jobs and enhance their, their capacity as we continue to change. Yeah, thanks David. And I wanna pick up on that for my next question. Um, Ebony highlighted some key findings that really pointed to the vulnerabilities of some, of some populations in terms of their risk of being displaced due to automation. Um, and I think some of those same populations, when we're looking at disruption coming out of COVID, are also pretty vulnerable. So that is low wage workers, uh, low education workers, uh, Latino and black populations, particularly and women. So I know you all are from very different sectors, um, but you all have a, a wide range of types of workers that you rely on. What, um, what kind of strategies do you think are needed that are kind of targeted at these, at these more vulnerable workers and, and how, is that, um, how is that kind of playing out in your, in your sector? Um, and so let's go back to Mike again. 
Um, so, you know, it's interesting in, in our industry, one of the things that, that we boast about is there are a lot of entry level jobs. Um, there's a, a number of hotel GMs that, you know, started as, as dishwashers and, and a number of uh, people in, in most every hotel in Sacramento that, that have worked their way up. And as, as you said, you know, Evan, when you look at this report, so many of the impacted jobs are entry level. And, um, you know, I think about just, you know, when you stay at a hotel, the, the things that, that we do now, if you forget toothpaste, you call down to the front desk and they send somebody up with, with a tube of toothpaste. I see all of that changing. Um, you know, maybe it's whatever the system is, whether it's a tech system or something in your room that you don't need people answering these phones for a lot of these things at hotels. You will not need a key to get in your room. Everything will be on your phone. You, you won't have to talk to anybody when you go to a hotel. You can order room service from your phone. So, so that's, you know, one of the things that we see and one of the concerns that we have moving forward with a lot of the, the technology. And certainly, you know, from a, um, a profitability standpoint, it makes sense for a lot of these businesses to, to go to automation. And candidly, we've talked about that at Visit Sacramento. You know, our funding is, is greatly jeopardized right now, and we've had to lay off a number of our employees. And for years, we've had a, a receptionist who greets people when they come in the door. And, you know, we're the Visitors Bureau, so it makes sense that we have a, an actual person there greeting people. Um, but, but that's likely going to change moving forward for us, and it's, it's, it's a cost issue. Um, you know, it's easy for us to, easier for us to, to lock the door and automate the phones and, and the front desk. And so when I think about the people we've had in that position, they have been uh, recent college graduates, they've been senior citizens. There are a lot of the people who are referenced in this report, so um, it, it is greatly concerning. Um, you know, as for a, a solution, uh, I, I, I'll be honest, I'm not sure that I have one just yet. And, and, and you know, this is a relatively new topic that we've been considering and certainly the hotels too. So, uh, you know, frankly, I'll be curious to hear what, what, what Kevin and, and David say about this uh, as, as we start to plan the future of our industry. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And I think that, um, you know, what we're experiencing with all the layoffs with COVID-19, I think there's a real concern that that's just gonna kind of accelerate this move to technology even faster than we ever imagined. So I agree with you, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a very, it's a difficult problem that, that I think everyone's grappling with right now. Kevin, I know you've been involved in a lot of talent pipeline work. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you see that pathway from, from entry level to, to other types of jobs in the manufacturing sector? Yeah, I, I definitely can. Um, I, I was thinking that was unique uh, to manufacturing, Mike, but I see that it isn't. Uh, you, you hire the lower level, you generally hire lower level. Uh, somebody is going to start with Siemens uh, as a material handler. They're going to be moving parts. Uh, they get an opportunity to work in assembly. They work, uh, move up to uh, electrical assembly. Then they express an interest to, say, move into a tech field, maybe uh, go to Sac City uh, and go to the HVAC program. Uh, and become a heating and ventilation air conditioning technician, which every one of our trains has on it, by the way. Uh, and, and they just move up uh, that, that chain of uh, capability. Uh, manufacturing has always provided that. Uh, what I think is important is we need to drive that because uh, things are happening, uh, innovation is coming, and frankly, manufacturers uh, are in survival mode. So uh, an organization like SVMI is there to try to help those small manufacturers do that. But I did wanna point out one thing about COVID that I think has really stood out to us. I have always told my employees when they uh, uh, expressed an interest from working from home a day or two, I said, no, we build trains in our plant. I don't want you working from home. And from one day to another, we had a significant portion of our workforce, all of the engineers, most of my quality management team, purchasing, sales, project management, working from home. So our big need has now come to figuring out how to integrate the remote workforce, with the workforce that by definition is still in the plant. And we are, are, are looking at technologies like data glasses, where you actually have a technician in our plant that's wearing data glasses 
the uh, engineer can see the same thing and she might be explaining to the uh, operator on the plant what you need to do in this particular case using technology like that. So COVID-19 is gonna accelerate that. Yeah, thanks Kevin, agree. Um, and David, I know you've worked a lot um, in workforce training and also in a kind of commitment to community. When you think about these vulnerable populations and these entry level workers, um, what, what comes to your mind in terms of possible pathways and, and solutions to help uh, reduce the vulnerability of these groups? Well, I, I think the first uh, point I would want to mention is, uh, again, somewhat historical, is the uh, disproportionate access and, uh, and availability of services in the community. So uh, if, if I was to submit some suggestions, um, I know this report was um, uh, either sponsored or helped uh, provided by SETA, for example, um, that, that funds local career centers that offer free services to the community. Uh, many different providers have various language. Uh, there's a lot of cultural competency. So I think before, you know, we even start to address where do they go, does the community even feel comfortable um, stepping in and, and entering these facilities, which again, in COVID times, is, is that even an opportunity at this point? Um, on top of that, there are you know, various uh, adult schools, uh, technical training centers, and really as, as was mentioned by uh, my fellow panelists, you know, that, that more specific technical training to really enhance your skills. But ultimately, uh, what I've seen just in my recent experience uh, interacting with uh, communities that I cover across 22 Northern California counties is really, are, are, are these, is, is the workforce trainable? And are they, are, is there a potential for them to be able to adapt to these changing times? Which I think is one of the most essential conversations is, okay, so there is an opportunity, um, but you need to change your mentality. You need to change your, uh, as Kevin said, from one day to another, <laughs> things have been changed. They will continue to change. And can, can you at that time, um, do you have a willingness to change? All right, thank you. And that's good. Like thinking, I want to anchor back to the survey questions that we asked of the uh, webinar participants. And we heard that um, for the most part, these some technology changes that people are experiencing right now have been really rapid, but they're also pretty welcome. And, and the majority of people are really anticipating changes as a result of technologies coming in the next three years, whether it's just a little bit or a lot. So, um, when it comes to these types of disruptions, especially technology disruptions, there's, uh, there are, there's risk, and we've talked a little bit about that, about job displacement, but there's also a lot of opportunity. So I might end with a little bit of a lightning round, um, asking you, what, what do you see that's exciting um, in your work and in your sector when it comes to either using new technologies that we're just seeing come up, uh, taking advantage of changes that, that have happened as a result of COVID-19 um, for something good, but kind of what do you see on the horizon and what are you excited about? I'm going to shake up our order a little bit and start with Kevin. Uh, something I'm excited about is uh, everybody's got a super powerful tool uh, in their pocket with the smart mobile device. Unfortunately, for many years, we've not only requested but kind of mandated that our employees put that in their pocket and work with paper or uh, computers uh, during the day. One of the th things that I really see uh, happening is much more moving to putting as much information and power in our uh, each individual employee's fingertips. You can call that automation, you can call it power to the people. And it's going to be training those people to really make decisions. They're going to be their own little managers. It's not going to be command and control. It's going to be employees being able to know the information, having it at their fingertips, and, and doing it. And that's what we need to uh, wrap, our, you know, wrap our arms around and, have, and make happen. Great. Thanks. How about you, David? Uh um, again, coming from a, uh, you know, the perspective of uh, my team and I as, as census employees, we uh, were previous work at home uh, staff 
staff, calculating staff. And to that point, what I've really seen, and this is, you know, speaking with my community, friends, and family, is that people have learned how to multitask, really how to balance um, work and life. Because if you're, you're at home working, you have the dog running around, you have the kids, you have a lot happening. So I've, I've really seen an increase in the ability for people to, um, you know, further just manage uh, their daily production of both professional and personal lives, um, as well as enhance discipline. Because again, not everyone was used to or still may not be used to working at home. So, you know, as, as we increase our skill sets, these are all skills that will be useful um, moving forward in the future as well. Absolutely. Thanks. And finally, Mike, what do, how about you? Exciting things in the uh, tourism hospitality industry. Yeah, so, so it's interesting. I, I'm one of those people who bought a car online a couple of years ago without ever seeing it. I had the, the salesman walk around the car on FaceTime to make sure there weren't any big dings or anything. Uh, bought it online. He delivered it to me. It was fantastic. And, you know, we've seen some of that in the industry for us being able to reach customers that we could never reach before. And, and some of that is with virtual tours, you know, having somebody who's in a different country, who's curious about Sacramento tour it virtually and hopefully set up a, an in-person trip later. Having uh, media on the East Coast who are not able to come to Sacramento for whatever reason, like right now, being able to, to tour Sacramento and, and us show them some of the, you know, hot spots and some of the restaurants. And then also as, and again, as a product of COVID-19, one of the things we've been talking about is changing how the restaurants are, you know, expanding the dining room so that they can bring more customers in and people can safely socially distance. That means coming onto the sidewalks, onto the street, setting up tables in the middle of the street and closing those down. Um, probably changes the way you order your food. So the idea is, you know, with, with more customers, in some ways you can ensure that, that they need employees on site, um, but it's, it, the, the technology is, is allowing them to change their model uh, to, to, you know, be up to speed with what's going on with COVID. And then, you know, again, some of the things that we all do on a regular basis, podcasts and things like that, that, um, you know, I think we're all starting to take for granted because it's become such habit, but what a way to learn about something that you don't know much about without going there. And, and so we've found great success with a lot of our podcasts well. And, and um, the last thing I'll say is what we're on right now, you know, a lot of us are meeting this way and, and I don't think, Zoom meetings and, and you know things of this nature will ever replace conventions. I think conventions will probably look different for a little while. And I know somebody asked me that question, but you know, at the beginning of this, we have somebody from Reading who's tuning in. So you have the ability to learn and attend things that don't have to be in your in your backyard or your hometown. I think that's incredibly valuable. Thank you. And I agree, actually, as from we've been organizing a few webinars, and I think it's also um, you can plan things quicker, you can pull in great speakers like you all, sometimes on shorter notice because there's less of a um, less of a barrier of entry for everybody. So that I think that is an exciting um, thing that's emerging right now as well. Okay, um, that concludes my questions. I want to turn it over to the audience and see what's come in in Q&A. So Renee, um, do you have any questions that have come in? I do. One of the questions that has come in is, what is your advice to people preparing students for the future workplace, to high school teachers, parents, um, other teachers, and what is essential to include in career planning curriculum? Any of our panelists want to, want to dive in? Well, I think something, uh, this is Kevin, I think something that has always been a focus, but uh, is flexibility and resiliency. Uh, being able to uh, quickly adapt to situations. Uh, manufacturing uh, used to be industrial arts. People found an aptitude for it, trained in high school, and went into it. Uh, now we're finding that people uh, come into it a different way. They are involved in the robotics club in junior high school, might do some career technical education in, uh, in high school, uh, but probably need to go to a community college to get more uh, understanding of a particular uh, type of education. And I think what we're going to find, that's always been a hard sell in the last few years because you, you look at the, the students and their parents and they're thinking, you're taking the dream of a four-year education away from me. 
If I'm looking at a four-year education that's going to be online at UCLA anyway, compared to hands-on education at a com community college that's going to get a real job for me, it might be a game changer. Yeah, I, I would add to that. And I think that's that, that's spot on, Kevin. I would add to that just from a, a technological standpoint. I, I think, you know, kids coming out of school are in a different place than us. You know, I remember um, when I was in school and, and this probably dates me a little bit, but, you know, my my dad would always ask me to set up the, the DVD player in the stereo because he had no idea how to do that. And I just learned it from a technology standpoint. And, and we see this with some of the younger folks that we've hired that some of the things that that, you know, uh, folks who aren't quite as young as we used to be struggle with is just second nature to them. So I think a lot yeah. of them will be prepared just in the era that they've grown up in and, and the technology that they've grown up around. Um, and and I, I do see a, a switch with some of the younger folks coming out of school that they'll be able to, you know, to lead a lot of those conversations and, and I think create opportunities to um, influence business in, in different ways than perhaps my generation did just because you know, like every generation, they see things a little bit differently. So I, I think it's incredibly valuable. And I think the technology that is in school now, you know, my, my recommendation would be increase as much as that as, as can be done and, and make sure we're exposing these kids um, to, to, you know, the opportunities and, and you know, kind of the, the dreams of the future that, that can come through technology. And then really just to add on to that as well is, uh, just as Mike mentioned, uh, I, I remember uh, growing Growing up and my father saying you spend all day playing video games and you know there was this negative uh, perception of you know yes I was I was I was tinkering around I was playing around but really to to the point of my fellow panelists is our younger generations spend um, even pre-COVID spend a lot of time on these devices are extremely savvy and and really ultimately it's creating a a knowledge base that is fun for them, they, they enjoy it, and ultimately could uh, roll into different career opportunities. But again, there will be need for an advancement in education and technical skills as well. Great, and I'll chime in from personal experience um, with my nine-year-old son, I hope uh, video games leads to good um, education <laughs> opportunities for him, <laughs> especially during uh, COVID-19. Um, okay, I, I, I'm committed to keeping us to the one o'clock time frame. So I'm afraid we don't have time for more questions from the audience. However, there is the Q&A chat box. So, um, so visit it and, and see if we can maybe answer some questions um, that way as we're wrapping things up. Um, could we advance, actually, I think two slides. All right, um, I wanna just speak really briefly about next steps in terms of this research and the work that we're doing around this. So, um, we want to make sure, just like we did with the panel, that this quantitative data that we're collecting, we're really understanding how, um, how it's playing out on the ground and how um, companies and sectors are thinking about these technology issues and automation. And so we're doing a series of interview with chief technology officers and HR directors to get a better understanding. And then we're gonna publish some more findings on that um, to add to our body of research around this. Uh, we also want to make sure that we're focused on solutions. So we're going to be convening uh, roundtables throughout the summer to really focus on the challenge areas. So when we're looking at things like minimum wage jobs, I think uh, devising sectors around that is, has never been more relevant than it is now. And when we're thinking about economic recovery in our region, that's just a really important aspect. And also, it's really important to us to share this data widely. We want to raise the profile of these issues, and we want to be able to align across various planning efforts that are going on. So we're going to be working to make sure we're communicating about the report. Um, for our more general 21st century workforce portfolio area, uh, we have some other things going on. Renee, do you want to jump in and talk about those? I do. Uh, we do have a workforce uh, webinar. There will be additional workforce webinars focusing on the future of work. Um, so we will keep you um, informed. If you're not receiving our workforce newsletter, then if you could put your email address in the chat box, we can grab that real quick and that'll make sure that you have an invitation to future webinars as well as um, get our monthly workforce newsletter. And I just want to apologize to those who uh, submitted questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, all those questions were fantastic and uh, hopefully um, you received enough information in this webinar to at least give you a, a jumping off point. Absolutely. Um, and next slide. 
Yes, exactly. That's what I wanted. So if you if you do have more questions and you want to get in touch with us, here's our contact information for both Renee and I. And um, we could also, of course, outreach to the speakers to try to get any questions answered. So um, any follow up, please get in touch with us. I think this concludes our webinar. Thank you so much for being here. And um, we hope we can all we, we hope we can see you whether virtually or uh, in person sometime soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Don't everybody. forget to do your census, 2020 census. <laughs> yes, and I, now. Yeah, and thank you especially for all of our speakers and our contributors today. I really appreciate your participation.